sorry, um, about 5 um, uh, kV to 90 kV, having um, uh, uh, and knowing that we are working um, mainly on the on the below, um, let's say 40, 45 kV. Uh, here you have a schematic uh, view of the optic arch uh, with a typical uh, typical element for uh, for tailoring the beam for uh, um, conditioning the uh, the white X ray beam that we receive from a single uh, band of uh, insertion device from the ring. So we have primary slit uh, attenuators and uh, the, the first collimating cylindrical mirror with the fixed geometry, having uh, two um, uh, parallel, two different uh, coating for filtering uh, um, harmonics at uh, two di a different range of energy, silicon for uh, uh, um, lower energy and uh, platinum coating for high energy. Uh, a series of beam monitors, uh, wide beam monitors, uh, monochromatic beam monitors to, to check the position of the beam on the, on the, on the beam line in, uh, in case of problems. The monochromator, which is the, 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 uh, the core of the optics, which is able to receive and select uh, um, the, the range of wavelength uh, for, for our experiment. And it's, of course, uh, scanning during our uh, energy scan uh, for the excess uh, or sun is acquisition. And, uh, and you see in red uh, next to it a big uh, cryo cooler, cryo -cooler um, for uh, cooling using uh, liquid nitrogen. Then a second, uh, and then another a second uh, mirror. Uh, in this case, it's toroidal. Uh, again, with a fixed geometry, uh, fixed geometry, in, and uh, but it's of course able to be tuned for for optimizing the beam. And the beam shutter that is going to feed the the first experimental hatch. This is a, the a schematic view of such uh, experimental cabin in which uh, we are going to actually work uh, this afternoon. This uh, cabin this uh, receives an unfocused beam, a large uh, a large beam for a typically uh, transmission um, geometry experiment measurements, and for which uh, samples are um, typically uh, homogeneous and large samples. Here the beam size is millimeters by millimeters and uh, two by two, something like this. So it's quite large. So requires, of course, if the beam is large, a, 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 a sample which uh, uh, is, is homogeneous. And here uh, you have a, a very simple um, uh, setup with a simply a, a, a ion chamber I zero which uh, uh, monitors the incoming beam, an ion chamber I1 that monitors the beam after the sample. This is uh, the second uh, experimental cabin, EH2, uh, which again has got uh, um, uh, receiving uh, ion chamber A0, I0, the sample chamber in between, and the ion chamber A1 for uh, um, monitoring the uh, outcoming beam. And, and something uh, typical of uh, this kind of experiment, uh, uh, the, uh, the camera, uh, an arm con uh, containing reference coils and uh, an ion chamber that is uh, monitoring the, the, the signal after the, the reference coils. Reference coils, probably you, you, you heard about this morning or uh, you know from your, uh, from your um, background in uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy are needed in, in, um, in this experiment to calibrate, to, have, uh, uh, to be sure that the, the energy is not moving uh, during, the, during the experiment for an artifact that might be due to uh, uh, drift or shift or, or vibration of, of the optics, typically the, 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 mon the monochromator or the source. But knowing that the, 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 the edge of the element uh, doesn't move during the experiment, we are able to, to position, to, recall it, to re, um, re reposition all the, all the edges and be able to interpret any shift from the edge as a, a, real, um, a real effect of the sample. 
so the experiment uh, uh, no um, i thought i had uh, no sorry the experiment today is going to be carried out in the first experimental cabin as i said before and uh, the sample is going to be accommodated in this uh, um, bell jar with a small uh, um, sample uh, chamber uh, which is actually in, in real life uh, looking like this uh, and the, the, the sample is accommodating, uh, uh, accommodated, as you can understand, in the, in the inside uh, this, um, this chamber, and we can access it from the um, oblot that you can see in front of you the, with the with the, um, glass uh, surface, which gives us also the chance to, to be able to visually inspect the, um, the sample during our experiment. And to conclude, these are the typical sample uh, holders uh, that we're using during our experiment, which, uh, as you can see, uh, allow us to have um, uh, six uh, uh, sample positions that we can, we can um, um, have during our experiment. And so we were able to tell the, 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 the acquisition to uh, translate such a sample holder uh, in, in time in order to collect, uh, for example, long uh, acquisition, long, long data acquisition during the night, for example, on a on, on number of different samples. How, uh, are we, how, how do we um, control our experiment uh, from, the, from the control cabin? Uh, we, um, uh, this is the, the, we, we are controlling the, um, the experiment using a, a line of computer and, um, and a, a system which is, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, video strap, is called SPEC. And, uh, and, and, and it's essentially um, very close to C++ uh, uh, programming language. But the peculiar of our beamline is a couple of of um, of uh, uh, GUI in which you can set up your uh, acquisition, which is the the case scan setup, as you can see on the on the right side of the um, the right side of this slide, which can uh, give the details of the of the acquisition because um, in in your um, in your acquisition probably you don't want the same uh, uh, step in, in, in monochromatic angle or in energy for all the, the, the range of your uh, 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 of the spectra. In particular, uh, spectroscopists like to uh, give uh, uh, different ranges for different K, uh, uh, K ranges of the, of the spectra. So this uh, GUI allows you to, to define uh, the free edge interval. The, 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 the step to, 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 to have during this uh, pre-age, which is quite large, like 5 EV, because there is there is no information there. And to define uh, an end and, uh, and a start and an end range for the edge, which is uh, uh, what you're interested in um, very often, and the fine step, in this case, 0.5, and at the very end of the of the of the k range uh, spectra then uh, once set this value which so the, the 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 logic which is the the the, um, the strategy of the acquisition for your sample you can uh, launch the the acquisition on uh, on a number of, of, of samples for example typically uh, four or five, uh, six samples uh, uh, that the sample holder can contain, giving uh, another, um, giving each a name, of course, position of some uh, uh, critical motors, uh, which are positioned in the sample in the beam, and, um, and the energy of the, of the edge that you are interested in. In this case, 31 is not the edge that you are, um, uh, I'm going to look at it today because we're going to look at we're going to work at carbon you know, K edge. Um, this was my uh, 15 minutes introduction, and um, 
and I'm going to leave um, uh, the the and I'm going to leave the uh, the screen and the keyboard to Tommaso that is going to uh, continue this presentation. And by the way, I forgot to say that we are going to have a coffee break, but a little later. We're going to uh, um, go start some acquisition first. So, first of all, good afternoon. I'm uh, Tommaso Baroni, a PhD student in uh, Heart Science at the Department of Heart Science at the University of Florence in Italy. And I'm currently working on uh, BM08, the beam line that Michela just presented to you, as a long uh, visitor. And I'm working both as a obviously as a local contact for external user and other stuff. And I'm uh, measuring and doing experiments for my PhD project research about environmental remediation. And in particular, ways to remediate mercury polluted waters. So as Michael was saying, we are currently acquiring uh, the spectra of a cadmium selenide sample. So we have this cadmium selenide in the EH1 chamber sample holder, and we are performing a transmission experiment. So first of all, I would like to show you a little thing if I'm able to connect. Oh, by the way, as I've written in chat before, if you want, you can send me an email and I will send you the presentation, the slideshow that Michela just showed you and that I am going to show you in a few minutes. Okay, so okay. So instead of show you, showing you a standard PDF presentation, I'm gonna immediately show you the softwares that we are gonna use in order to reduce and treat the data from the SAS experiment. The two softwares are Athena and Artemis. Athena is a software used in order to plot the data and starting the normalization process. While Artemis is a program that we are gonna use later in the afternoon in order to treat the data imported to Athena and perform a proper fit in order to be able to acquire information on the local structure around our desired element. Now we are, as we said, we are acquiring uh, the spectra of a sodium selenide, uh, sorry, sodium uh, cadmium selenide sample, sorry, at the K edge of cadmium. So around 26 kilo electron volts. While we are acquiring the spectra, I will show you in the meantime, a spectra of a copper foil standard in order to be a little more, uh, how can I say, in order to have a little bit of experience with the Athena software before treating our real data. So, by the way, this is Athena, the interface. All the time, you will have this kind of visualization with all the different options and a graphical window. 
where you can see your plotted spectra. So let's import the data from a copper foil that position the cell spectra of a copper foil. So this is the graphical window I was saying before, where you can see what I what you are currently plotting and importing in Athena. And this menu control what you are really importing, the data that you are importing in the program. And the very cool feature of Athena is that you can import together the spectra of your sample and the spectra of the reference. Because as Michaela said before, it is really important to acquire for each spectra of each sample that you are interested in, also a spectra of the reference. So you will have the sample and the reference afterwards the sample, and you will be able through uh, your ionization chambers to record the signal of the beam passing through the sample and then the reference. In this case, this is the file you are importing, and through these boxes, you are taking the data that you want to import, to really import in Athena, and you want to plot in the graphical window. So this copper foil was acquired in the EH1 chamber, and it is a transmission spectra, transmission analysis. So you want to plot I0, which is the intensity of the incident beam, on I1, which is the intensity of the transmitted beam passing after, after having passed through the sample. Obviously, you want to import them in a natural log, because as you know from the theoretical lesson that you had this morning, but also simply for the law of Lambert beer, which is the base of every spectroscopy technique. In this case, the coefficient of absorption is the natural logarithm of the ratio between incident and transmitted intensity. So in this way, you can click replot in order to see, to graphical see what you are really importing. Meanwhile, you can select the columns referring to the reference. In this case, I can already tell you if even if this file is not uh, correctly labeled, that this one is the intensity of the transmitted spectra of the sorry, of the transmitted beam after the reference. So I want to import in order to have the spectra of the reference, this column on this one, where I1, yes, is the intensity of the transmitted beam after the sample, but now is the incident beam before the reference. By the way, if you have any kind of question, any curiosity, if uh, I don't know if you have something that you didn't understand and you want to check again, you can simply write in the chat because Michaela is currently see at this, is currently looking at the chat. So if you have any kind of question, you can type there and then Michaela will report to me. Now, if I click on OK, I have now imported the spectra of the sample together with the spectra of the reference acquired together with the sample. And I can display into the graphical window my spectra. I can play a little bit with the, uh, I don't know, with the visualization option, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So with this version of the Athena, you can see here you have two kind, two color, two different color of buttons that you can use in order to plot, to, well, yeah, to change the graphical plotting options of the sample that you are currently selecting. So if I want to plot in the energy space, the sample, uh, the sample spectra, 
I will have to click on the sample spectra and click obviously on the E button. If I want to display my spectra in the wave vector space, I simply click on K and as you can see, the visualization changed. If I want to do a Fourier uh, transformation of the spectra in the wave vector space, I simply click on R. And now I have a visualization of my spectra in the distance space, et cetera, et cetera. The violet buttons instead are used in order to plot together multiple spectra. So if I tick both of the spectra and I want to visualize both of them at the same time, I will now click on the purple visualization buttons. And as you can see here, the two spectra are exactly the same because we were analyzing a copper foil in the EH1 chamber and a copper foil in the reference chamber. So this is the result we were expecting, the same exact spectra. Same exact spectra, obviously, in the uh, energy space, but also in the wave vector space and in the distance space, as you can see. So once you import a spectra in Athena, the first thing you want to do is to proper normalize the spectra because these are raw data and you need, in order to do any assumption about your spectra, you need to normalize it in a proper way. So a SAS spectra is normalized doing in, in three steps generally. First of all, you need to acquire a good free edge line, which is the function which model the free edge, uh, free edge part of our spectra. Then you'll need to choose a good post edge line, which is the function who model the exact part of the spectra, so the past edge part of the spectra itself. And then you will need to adjust the E0 parameter, which is the edge of the spectra itself. So first of all, in order to take a good free edge function, you'll need to change the free edge parameter here in the free edge range Usually, a good pre edge uh, function starts in the farther point of your spectrum, which in this case, I can already tell you, is minus 200 electron volts. By the way, all the numbers that you see here, almost all the numbers, are electron volts in respect to the edge. That's why the parameter E0 is so important because. Obviously, if you change the edge, these parameters will change their meaning, obviously. Then you will you want to take the final point of your free uh, edge line, free edge function, a little bit farther away from the edge. So you don't want to include in the free edge line any feature of the edge. In order to do so, it is better to zoom a little bit on the edge of the spectra. Here through the, this line, you can change the range of zooming of the graphical window. So in, the, in this case, I can simply put 100 minus 100. Obviously also here, the unit is electron volts in respect to the edge. Then I'll click on E. The visualization obviously is changed. And you can already see that this is the final point of my free edge line. This is the edge, the current edge that the system automatically take. And you can see that the spectra here arise a little bit in this section, 
So maybe it's better to put this final point a little bit further away from the edge itself in order to be sure not to take any points which are, uh, how can I say, sorry, any points which are bounded to the spectra itself. So if I take this point and I don't know, I can simply put minus 40. Now this point is a little bit farther away from the edge. And now I'm sure that I'm not taking any point related to the edge itself. Because you see here, the spectra arise a little bit. So I know that here it is already feeling, but it is already, I can say, under the effect of the edge. And so this is our free edge line. Which now currently, which now it is correctly modelizing the free edge part of the spectrum. Then, second step, post edge line. Clicking here, I can visualize the function that my system that Athena is currently using in order to normalize the spectra. And a good post edge line. Follow. Okay. A good post edge line follow the spectra without following the oscillation. And ideally, you want your pre edge function. You want cutting the half of the oscillation. So a good post edge line follow the spectra, but doesn't follow the oscillation and cuts in the middle point, approximately, your oscillation. So here you can see that, okay, plotting the entirety of the spectra. Well, it's pretty long. Okay, this is the entirety of our spectrum. We can take this point, which is the end on the of the post edge function, and we can put it like here in order to modelize in a proper way this part of the spectrum, which is not properly modelized. The post edge line is controlled by this normalization range line here. So I can put, I don't know, 1600 uh, trim volts. It's too far away. 1,500, okay, better. So it's not currently modelized in a perfect way. It is better than before, but hmm, maybe you can do better playing a little bit with these values. Let's try 1,450, mm, no. So probably we will not be able to modelize perfectly this last part of the spectra. So the best we can do is to put the last point of the spectra itself, like 1,500. I think this is the best possible result. Maybe you can go 1,520 or something like that. Mm, no, 1,500. The rest of the function, is pretty good. We can maybe try to lower a little bit this post edge line. This is the point, the reference point that Athena is taking in order to start the function. So we can change this a little bit and move. Maybe we can try to move this point here in order to see if the function will change its shape. Okay, I didn't get the point I wanted, but it is better than before. You can see that now it is catching perfectly in a, this oscillation here. And also the last part of the spectra is better. We can try, so this point probably should be 120 electron volts. Okay. Well, I don't see any 
major change. Maybe you can try something really extreme. So to putting a point which is really close to the edge to see if something changed for the better. And yes, I can say that this point is actually really good because now you, you see that the last part of the spectra is properly modelized. And also this first part is better than before. By the way, this first oscillation here is called white line. And you don't want to model it, to modelize it with your post edge line because it will be really complicated. Every element has a different white line in terms of width and in terms also of height. So here, copper has a pretty small white line, but we will see with cadmium, other elements have a has a really big, 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 big white line, which is impossible to be cut in half without, I don't know, losing all this oscillation, without properly modelizing all this oscillation. So, as you saw, this process of choosing a good pre-edge and possible edge line, uh, it is pretty, how can I say, it's not precise to the 0 0.001 electron volt. So it's like I'm helping the system to take a good normalization, but it has not to be perfect. Okay, so don't worry if in one of your future spectra you will have a post ledge line which is not perfectly cutting enough all your oscillation because sometimes it is impossible to have. You will have to try to get the best result possible. That's for sure. So now we have a pre edge, we have a post edge line. Let's check the E0, which is the last step of normalizing a spectrum. In order to check this parameter, you will need to plot your spectra as a derivative in function of energy. So in order to do that, you simply click on derivative, on the option derivative, which is right here, and you zoom a little bit around the edge. A little bit more. Perfect. So your E0, so your edge, will be the first maximum of derivative. So you see that this is your current E0, and it is located on the maximum of the first derivative peak. So it is pretty good. Maybe we can move it a little bit on the left. So you can simply play with this value and see. I don't know why it went like here. Let's try to change it a little bit. Well, I don't know why Athena is visualizing this point floating in midair, but I can assure you that this value is correct. So this is the maximum, the first maximum of derivative of your spectrum. So it is a pretty good E0. And I'm sorry if I'm switching a lot between this interface and the graphical window, but unfortunately this program and in particular the next one we are gonna see, Artemis, have a lot of different window. So when you will need like two displays or a 30 inch monitor in order to plot them in a proper way in order not to switch every time between the different menu they are not perfectly optimized but they're pretty good for the job okay so now you know that clicking the normalize button you will have a properly normalized spectrum. So this is your spectra normalized. Next step, 
check your spectra in the K space. So in the wave vector space. Here, I can already tell you that this K max is not the current, it's not the real K max. We can go up to at least 18. Okay, maybe even more, 20. Okay, so this spectra is pretty long and is really, really, really good. So you can really look to this spectra and forget it because usually when you have natural samples or complicated samples, you will never have such a good spectra, such uh, a good quality of the signal without background noise. This is a really, really, really good spectrum. We will see afterwards the spectra of our sample, which is a standard. So it will be pretty good, but it will not be as good as this one. Usually the metal poles are really good candidates in order to obtain the best spectra possible. So with this window option, you're gonna see graphically how much of the K space you are going to use for your Fourier transformation. Because as you seen this morning, in order to go from the wave vector space to the distance space, you will need to perform a Fourier transformation. The window, the K window, has to be the larger possible, obviously. So you want to use as much, uh, um, as much signal as possible, but you will have to, how can I say, you will have to look really to the noise. If your spectra is really, really, really noisy, probably you want to transform in the distance space a little bit less of your signal. We will see with the real sample spectrum, okay? But in this case, since this signal is all pretty good, we can take as much as we want. Here, the K range for the Fourier transformation is controlled by this line in the antenna. So you can see that your maximum can be without any problem around 18. Your starting point, I say I would, I want to have a, the start of the integration window right here, because a good Fourier transformation window has to be, okay, wider as possible, but it doesn't, you don't want your window to cut enough an oscillation. Okay, never cut enough an oscillation with your window. So for example, 3.2, change the zoom. Oh, I think I know why. 3.2, okay, maybe even 3.5, perfect. And here I can move maybe a little bit further away. So like 18.4, maybe a little bit more, 19. As I said, forget these values. Normally you will arrive to K12, K13, and you will be really happy for that result. Having a Fourier transformation window up to K19 is very, very rare. So now if I click on the R button, my R space will be the K window I took before Fourier transform in this space. And here you can see what distance 
contributes to the oscillation of your spectrum. So this plot really tells you, okay, I have a very, very, very strong signal coming from a distance around here. Another one coming from around here, another two coming from around here. I will not say around 2.2 Armstrong of distance because now you, when you use Athena, you are not visualizing the exact number. So this, this is like a qualitative analysis, okay? A first step analysis. We will really talk about precise distance and precise numbers once we will move to our tennis. But now, the only thing that you can tell is that the signal, the most intense signal, so the most intense oscillation is coming from uh, atoms, from neighbor's atoms surrounding your central one, in this case, the copper that you are exciting with your radiation from around this distance. So this is Athena. I think that we just finished the acquisition of the spectra of the real sample. So let's look to the cadmium selenide. In order to do that, we want, first of all, to import, this is the spectra, to import the spectra in this computer. I will show you some passages that you don't need to, to know how they work precisely. This is how a local contact will help to prepare your data. So there is this kind of Python script, which we use in order to treat the raw data. So this is the spectra that we just acquired. We open it, we treat with the script, and now it is ready to be imported in Athena. So let's say file, import, we take the cadmium selenide spectra, open. And now, as we have done before, we will choose the columns to be imported in our program. So this is the most realistic situation. You saw before, for the copper spectra, we had like five, six columns. This is a proper file with a lot more columns than before. And all these zeros are related to the fluorescent detector because now, as we said before, we are acquiring a transmitted spectra. So in this case, we turn off the fluorescent detector in order not to register any kind of fluorescent signal. And that's why we have all these zeros. So since our sample is in the EH1 chamber, we need to look to the I0 and I1 EH1 signal. So not this one, not this one, but these two. I0, EH1, I1, EH1, which would be the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh column from the end of the spectrum. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight column. Well, I think I made a mistake. So probably this two. Okay, perfect. So let's check again. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. One, two, three, four, five, 
six and seven. Perfect. So natural log, since we are looking to transmit the spectra, and obviously we want I0 on I1. This is the correct shape that a SAS spectra should have. Then we want to import together with the sample its reference. So we click on import reference channel, which should be, since the reference is in the reference chamber, we want to look to I1 EH2, which will be the incident signal for the reference, and IX EH2, which will be the transmitted signal for the reference. So this is much easier. One, two, three, four, five, six. So is the fifth and the sixth column. And so five and six, natural log. Same element, obviously, because I can already tell you that in the reference chamber, we have a cadmium foil. So both of them natural log, okay. And now I have also my cadmium selenide spectrum and its reference acquired together with a sample. You can already see that it is a pretty good spectra. If I plot it in K, it is pretty, pretty good. But here, you see at K around six, well, already at K around 13, you can see a little bit of noise in the signal, which obviously increase the higher you go in energy. Here you can see a really deep spike. This is a, a glitch of the monochromator. In order, you can remove this point in order to get to have a smoother spectra because this is obviously an error, a systematic error. Well, no, sorry, a random error. It's not systematic since probably if we would have acquired another spectra, it would probably, well, maybe move to another value of energy or simply disappear. I don't know. But this is clearly an error and it's pretty common. Sometimes it happens. You can simply remove it. But instead, in respect with the copper, here we can use the violet buttons in order to plot both of them. Obviously, you will have very different scales. You can adjust that much in order only to see the quality of the spectra, you see that the red one is pretty noisy starting from K13, while our copper foil spectra is almost perfect up to K1617. So as before, we want to normalize our spectra. So first of all, we want to choose a pre-edge and a post-edge lines. Pre-edge line, we can zoom a little bit around the edge in order to be able to see a little bit better the function. So here you see, this is noise, obviously. So we can move the starting point of the pre-edge on the first point of the pre-edge region, like here, and we can move this finish, the, the last point of the pre-edge function a little bit further from the edge itself. So for example, minus 200, and uh, this is already minus 16, 60, sorry, we can go to minus 70. So, well, this is, seems to be pretty good. Maybe we can move this one a little bit further in order to be sure not to take any signal influenced by the, the rising of the edge itself. So we can go, I don't know, minus 80, for example, and we should be fine. So now we have a function which modelizes perfectly the pre-edge region of the spectrum. 
first edge. We zoom a little bit out. A little bit more. And you can already see that, well, this one, you, you see this little indentation here. This one, this is probably the cause of the glitch we saw before in the case space. So this is a problem of the monochromator. So here we can move the last point of the post edge line a little bit further away. And this one maybe can be moved right here, for example, because we want to lower a little bit this purple line, the post edge puncture, in order to try to cut also these two oscillation here. We will not be able to cut them enough, probably, but we can try. This is, as I said before, this is the white line for cadmium, which is pretty different from the white line of copper. But we don't care about how the post edge cuts the, post, the white line. So first of all, we go to normalization range. We put, I don't know, 1,250. A little bit less, 1240, 30. And now the post edge line, the end of the post edge line is the end of the spectra itself. So let's move the starting point a little bit lower. So if we want to move from here to here, this will probably be. 50 electron volts from the edge. Let's try. So instead of 150, let's put 50 here. Okay. Well, it was not 50, maybe a little bit more, 55. Okay. So as you can see, this last portion of the post edge line is better than before because now it follows a little bit better the spectra itself. Here we were able to cut a little bit more this and this acceleration. Obviously, we will not be able to cut enough. We can try to move this point maybe here in order to see if something changed. So instead of 55, that should be probably 20. Okay. So now we are able to cut this oscillation enough, a little bit more this oscillation, but now we are losing these others. So this is cut enough, but this two, no. So I think that we can try to average this function, putting this point where we put that before, 55. And now the post edge line is cutting a little bit better this this and this oscillation, even if we will not be able to catch more these two. Okay, it's not a problem. You have to obviously try, as I said, the best result possible considering all the spectra. So now we have post edge and pre edge done. Let's look, let's take a look to the derivative. Let's zoom a little bit around the edge. And as you can see, the E0 is perfectly on the top of the first peak in the derivative space. So the E0 value is perfect. So now if we put the normalize option, we will be able to see the entirety of our spectra probably normalized. So now we can move to the K space, R space, and start to do some assumptions. So in the K dimension, this is the result. As I said before, you want to take a K window as wider as possible, but 
you want to avoid the, the part of the spectra affected by too much noise. So this spectra is not bad, okay? It's not at all. If we remove this glitch, maybe we can try to take all the spectra itself. The problem is that at higher k, the probability of taking too much noise, it's higher. So probably for now, I'll take only a window up to k15 or something like that in order to avoid this part of the spectrum. We have a lot of data. k15 is a pretty good limit for a, for a, a sample like this because it is acquired at ambient temperature. It is acquired with a very low energetic beam because now we have a beam which is only 35 milliampers of intensity instead of the usual 200 milliampers. That means that we have simply less photons in order to, to perform our analysis. So I'm perfectly satisfied with this result. I'll put 15 here. Okay, maybe a little bit less, 14.7. Okay. Mm, a little bit less, 14.6. Perfect. Starting point three. I think it's it's good. Normally. You see the, the Athena program itself put the K range starting at K3, because you never want to go under K2, 2.5, because the information that you can see here are bounded to the Xanis region of the spectrum. So the region near the edge. Now we are performing an exa analysis. So in order to, so, to do so, you always want your window starting around 2.53 units of K. Okay. So I think for now, this is a proper window to look at. Now, if we go to the distance space, you can see that my spectra, our spectra, it is mainly and probably it is almost 100% made by the signal coming from this peak, from this R distance. It means that we are looking to a first shell fit in our tennis. So we, were, we are not looking for, for example, instead with the copper, we can put the two together and plot it together, but the scale is not so good. I should be able to change the scale probably, not by the importance of K. Well, let's see one by one, maybe it's easier. So this is the cadmium. You see one very big acute peak around two point something. And this is my copper. It has almost the same distance for the first peak, but here you can see the contribute from at least another two, three peaks. So here we are able to see the signal coming probably from a second, third and fourth shell surrounding our copper atoms. While in the case of the cadmium selenite, perfect, I think. Okay, we almost crashed. While here, cadmium selenite, you see, you are not able to, this is all noise, I can already tell you, you are not able to see any other peaks. So probably with this kind of analysis, we are limited to observe a first shell signal. So 
we acquire spectra, we import with Athena, we normalize it. The next step will be saving this spectra in the key K dimension. So if you go to file and you save current group as key of K. Okay, this option right here. Save current group as key K. You can save it in the, in the folder of your experiment. It will take the key K extension to save it. And now you are able, you, you are ready to use Artemis in order to do a proper kit. So I don't know if you have any questions about this first part. As you can see, it was pretty schematic. In order, you have to memorize all the different operations that you have to do using this software. By the way, as I already told you, I have a PDF presentation with the slides illustrating this process that we had just done. So don't worry, you can simply send me an email in order to request the PDF presentation in order to have a little bit of a, a reference point. But yeah, that's all for Athena, okay? There are many, many other functions that you can use. For example, we saw before that we have this kind of, this glitch inside our spectra. We can use the, uh, where it is that the glitch, okay, from this, the line here, you can select, for example, the dig glitch and to truncate, sorry, data function. And using this function, plotting your spectra in key K. Oh, yes, we can go to 113 energy max. Okay, so. Come on, Athena. Sometimes the program itself is not as stable as you want, as not as responding as you want. So when you see that it is almost freezing, simply calm and not click around. So you see this point is the responsible for that glitch we saw before. So we can simply click on choose a point, click on this point, and remove it. In this way, if we go to the main window and we plot again in K our spectra, you see that the glitch is gone. You can recognize a glitch because it is due to only one point. That was an outsider, a really outsider, which has nothing to do with the signal of our sample that you can remove. You can confidently remove because you know that it is due to only one outside point. Here, for example, I will never, well, maybe this one, it is a glitch, but you, you don't want to remove all these little ticks because they are part of the signal. They are noise, obviously, but using the, the glitch function to remove these ticks means that you are altering your results. By the way, there are so many other functions which are pretty good. Another one is the align function. So for example, if I take multiple spectra of my sample, for example, before we took another one in order to control, simply control our sample, which should be, oh, we didn't treat with the Python, so. 
this one, definition. So we acquired two spectra for this sample, okay? We obviously normalize and do all this stuff with one of the spectra, but let's import also the other one. So why acquire multiple spectra for a sample? Obviously your objective is to reduce as much as possible the background noise. So for example, this one is two or three, I zero on I one, EH one, because the sample is in the experimental patch number one. And the reference should be EH one of EH two on I reference. So in this case, five on six, both natural log. So I import also the spectra, and you can see this is a second spectra for my sample. I will need to normalize in the same way in order to speed this process. I'll simply use the same values I used to normalize the cadmium cyanide spectra in order to normalize also the second one. So if I right click on the, the group, I can go to set market groups values to the current. And now also the second one will be normalized, you see, using the values of the first one. This is an operation you can do only when you have multiple spectra of the same sample and you are sure that your sample doesn't suffer from beam damage. Because sometimes you have, for example, biological samples that change while being exposed to the X-ray beam. So first of all, you need to be sure that your sample doesn't suffer the exposition from X-ray. This is an inorganic standard sample, so I'm pretty sure about that. And if I plot the two samples together, you can see they are almost the same. Well, they are not perfectly aligned. In order to check the alignment, I need to check the two reference because the reference, which is a cadmium foil, has to be always the same, has to give always the same spectrum, okay? So in order to align, to be sure that the two spectra of the reference are aligned, I can go to the align data, take this one, well, take this spectra here. So I want to align the two spectra using this reference. So I'll tick here this spectra. Well, sorry, but usually I use another version of Athena and it's a little bit different, but you simply want to put the two spectra you want to align here. And if they are pretty good, you click on auto align. The software will align the two spectra. I don't know why, but these, well, they are not so good as I was expecting. But if you return to the main window and you plot the two reference together now, you see, they are the same. There is a little bit difference in the amplitude of the oscillations here that you can see better maybe if I zoom a little bit. Here. But the most important part is that the edge has to be the same. You are looking to the same element, same foil, so the edge has to be the same. This oscillation in amplitude are probably due to the beam itself because we are using a very low energy beam and probably we were acquiring this spectra near the uh, red field of the beam 
I don't know if you know how the beam here at the ESRF function, but each hour you have a, a refilling in the storage ring. So the, the electrons which ground, which uh, run inside the storage ring are refilled every hour. And so you can have a little bit of shift in the intensity of the resulting beam. Normally, you, doesn't see, you don't see this shift in energy, but when you work at low values, you can see that. And you can see also here, there are, there are really big difference, considering that you are looking at the same spectra. Well, some, something didn't go as expected here. So by the way, the most important part is the alignment. So we align the edge itself. So now we can be sure that the two samples are perfectly aligned. You see that the little bit of shift we have we had before that is now gone. So the two spectra are perfect aligned. Here you can see for the red one, there is this indentation. Probably this is another glitch of the monochromator. If I put in K, let's see here. There is another glitch here, but that one is probably this one, which was not present here in the spectra we saw before. So this indentation here is probably due to the glitch we observed before in the spectra. And here, as before, we observe the same glitch in the same position. So I will not de-glitch that now, but I wanted to show you only one last function of Athena. When you acquired multiple spectra of the same sample, you can merge them together in order to reduce the noise. Usually, every four spectra you acquire, you cut in half the background noise. So when you have problematic samples, when you have samples that give you really noisy uh, signal, you can simply acquire multiple spectra of the same sample and then merge them together in order to have an average spectra with less noise. The more spectra you merge together, the better it is. Obviously, you have to consider that you have a, a limited amount of time in order to perform your experiment. So you need to choose between how many samples I'm gonna I'm going to, to measure how much quality per sample I want to have. But in this case, you simply click on merge. You first, you select obviously the spectra you want to merge. In this case, these two. You click on merge, merge, move of E. You are merging the two spectra in the energy dimension and you are merging the absorption coefficient. So you click on it. And you will have this spectra called merge, which is the result of the two spectra merged together. Now, if I plot, I don't know, one single spectra with a merge, I will not see much difference in the k dimension because they were, they both were, were a really good spectra, and uh, merging only two spectra doesn't produce such a, a great result in order to reduce the noise. But you can already see that the glitch that I didn't remove before, it is now less pronounced. The glitch here that I didn't remove before on the spectra, it is less pronounced. Also the noise here is less pronounced, etc. So even merging these two spectra did produce a result. Obviously, normally I would remove this glitch and this other one. And uh, I don't want to, how can I say, bring with me 
signal of glitches inside the inside our tennis. So first of all, I would have removed them. But in order to give you a, an idea of the merge function, this is how it works. Okay, so I think that for the this first box part, so for the Athena part, we can simply call the day. So remember, you normalize this, the, the spectra. If you have multiple spectra of your sample, you merge all together. When you are satisfied by the results, you simply click on file, save current group. Obviously, in this case, the merge. File, save current group as, key of K. You save the file, and you are able to go with our tennis to import that key K file in our tennis. Well, I really hope you are still alive. <laughs> I'm sorry if I bore you or something like that. I think we can simply take a coffee break. Let's continue our presentation, our tutorial, and let's go to the final last part, which is the utilization of the software Artemis in order to finally extract quantitative information about the, sur the atoms surrounding my central excited atom. In this case, uh, regarding the cadmium selenide sample, we want obviously to see what why um, what kind of atoms are surrounding my cadmium atoms and the distance between the cadmium and the selenium atom so the bond length cadmium selenium in order to do so first of all we simply open our tennis Right here. And I'm really sorry, I will try to be as much clear as possible, but this version of the Artemis, the, the meter version that we are looking to, has a, a, a lot of windows. In some cases, you are going to have five or six different menus on your desktop that you are going to use in the same time. So this is the software. Here you can see some graphical plotting options, really similar to the Athena ones. And here you have an interface like a, a little lobby where you can access different parts of the software itself. First of all, you want to open the key K file you saved before. So file, open. You go to the folder of your experiment. You put obviously all files. And here, should be the key k file okay this one key k we open it and now we have also this window which contain the spectra in the key k version in the key k extension okay and here uh, you have also a graphical window really, really similar to the Athena one, which you can control using this part of the software. Here, for example, we can put K18 as the maximum visualization. Here you can uh, plot the window for the Fourier integration or not. Here you can go to the Fourier space. Here you have in red the window for the Fourier fitting that we are going to see 
in few minutes. Okay, what you want to do in order to do a proper fit, first of all, you need to have a theoretical model which you think can mobilize in a proper way your sample. What I want to mean. In this case, we know that our sample contains cadmium selenide. We want a model which can mobilize a pure cadmium selenide SAS spectra. In order to do so, we can import in Artemis a SIF, a crystallographic information file of the phase we think we have in the sample. In this case, cadmium selenide. So let's go and download a CIF file from internet, C uh, A so F file, sorry, from internet, which we think can pretty much represent our sample. Not entirely, maybe our sample is constituted by more phases, but let's all the times you need to how can I can say think about what phase it's the mainly constituent of your sample. So we go on Google. I think you already know some uh, CAF file database, like the uh, American Mineralogist database, which is pretty good, the American Mineralogist Crystal Structure database, which you can use in order to download different C files. But if your institution has uh, an account, I would really, really, really uh, use ICSD. This site is wonderful in order to download any possible SIF file ever published. But you need to have uh, an account on this database in order to properly use it. So uh, a really simple, free way to download C file is the American Mineralogist Crystal Data Structure database. Otherwise, ICSD is, I think, your best option. You just simply put the chemical constituents of your sample, cadmium and selenium. You say that they are the only two chemical constituents, and you run a research, a query. And here you have all the different cadmium selenide phases ever published, which you can, for example, order from a, a special group indexing. So, for the cadmium center, there are two main phases that you can find an hexagonal one, special group P63MC, and another one, which is the cubic one, F minus 4, 3M. Obviously, at ambient pressure and temperature. Otherwise, you can find also another cubic variant, which is the Fm minus 3m. So we want obviously to take a CAF file of a phase at ambient temperature and pressure. So I'll take immediately an hexagonal one because uh, I already know that the cadmium selenide takes normally uh, an hexagonal output CETA kind of structure by experience, by literature. Otherwise, you will have to download first an hexagonal CAF file, then a cubic one, and try to do the fit with both of them in order to see which is the best fit, which CIF file can fit better your results, your sample. 
So in this case, let's say, well, I have this CIAF file published on Acta Crystallographica. So I'll take one of them, Acta Crystallographica. I think it's a, a perfect, uh, can you see um, Well, I, I think it's a, it's perfect. Yeah, I, I, think, oh, I think it's a perfect journal in order to look for really good CIF models so let's take this one of 1977 we can simply download it and i'll copy that in the folder of the experiment okay CDS eight. Perfect. And now I'm gonna to open it with our tennis. Import crystal data. All the files. The meeting. Let's import the file. Here you can see some information pretty basic information about the structure you are gonna import. And you have, once you checked the information, you click on run atoms, and then run fact. These two function will take your uh, crystallographic structure and will simulate uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy experiment in order to extract the spectra that you would obtain using that perfect crystallographic uh, information file, and in order to understand the components of that spectra, so the different path that the photoelectron wave take inside your crystallographic information file structure. Because you already know that the exa, the oscillation in the exa part of the spectra are due to the final form, the final stage of the photoelectron waves occurring inside your structure, which are diffuse, retro diffuse by the atoms surrounding your excited atoms, in this case, cadmium. So this menu here represents list all the different path that the photoelectron wave can take inside the structure up to five Armstrong. You see, breath is the distance between the central atom, in this case, I put cadmium as central atoms, and the atoms surrounding the cadmium, which are responsible for that signal in the exa spectra. And in the rank column, you see the probability of that signal inside your spectra. So for example, you know that the selenium surrounding the cadmium, the four atoms of selenium surrounding the cadmium with a tetrahedrical uh, coordination at a distance of 2.631 Armstrong are, prob are the most probable signal inside your spectrum, followed by the signal from the second shell of cadmium, so the 12 atoms of cadmium surrounding the four selenium, and so on. Okay. If I put, for example, if I go back into this menu, atoms, where I load my SIF file, here I can increase the distance in terms of Armstrong between the central atoms and the surrounding. So the, the distance which I'm looking to, okay? I'm interested in, uh, I don't know, 
atoms located around the 5.5 Armstrong. So this I will bring from five to six in order to be able to see also if the atoms located at 5.5 Armstrong are responsible for some kind of signal. So I will run atoms again. Here you see run, atom, run atoms simply calculate all the different positions of atoms surrounding the cadmium, my central one, up to the distance I would choose. This case around six also, okay? Round fab, simply calculate the path of the wave of the photoelectrons inside the structure up to, in this case, six Armstrong. Once I've done that, I will first of all import in uh, in this other this menu where I load my TK file, so my spectra treated with a pen. I will start importing the most probable path. Okay. So first of all, this one. In order to do so, I simply drag that here in the path list. So now in this menu, in the path, li path list, I have the selenium one one path. And here I have the information about the atoms which are scattering my wave part, wave, my, yeah, my photoelectron wave. So in order to see how much this path is affecting our experimental spectrum. I need obviously to tell through our tennis what variables I want to fit. In order to do so, I have to click on GDS here. GDS stands for Guess Death Set. And this is the list of all the variables I want to refine. You know, I think the, this morning you, you saw the complicated uh, EXA equation, which contains many terms inside. Our goal is to refine the different factors inside the EXA equation. First of all, the S0 squared, the delta energy, the delta distance, and the sigma squared. So this factor, the delta energy, obviously corrects difference in terms of energy between our experimental theoretical spectra. This factor obviously looks to the distance, difference in terms of distance between the central atoms and the surrounding one, the neighbors. This sigma square is the factor controlling the thermal agitation inside my sample. While this S0 square is a factor controlling, how can I say, the quality of my acquisition. So an ideal S0 square should be around one because it means that I was able to refine all the other variables. And so my experimental spectra and my built theoretical one, they are pretty much the same. So I was able to reach a really, really good fit. If my S0 square will be less than one, more than one. So it will be another kind of value. Usually it's less than one, but we'll see together. It means that I was not able to obtain a perfect 100% fit, but that is not a problem. So M stands for the, obviously the number of neighbors atoms. Usually, when you are doing a single shell fit, you can utilize a little trick. So you can put 
here in the number of neighbors one and in s0 square you can put the variable the name of one variable usually we use m and you put in the guest left set parameters in the variables to be refined m starting from i don't know zero leaving this variable as guest means that obviously your system will refine the variable without any limitation in the delta e zero you put i don't know usually we use the notation a naught e naught so here you will put e naught starting from zero delta r usually is del r here you will put del r starting from zero sigma square you can use the notation ss and usually when you do a fit of the sigma square variable you put the value of 0 0.00 Zero zero t is like a, a magical value. Well, here in end we can maybe put one, which is the desired value. Okay, so as I said, when you have a first shell uh, fitting, here you can put an n, and in s zero squared n. While when you will do a multiple shell fitting, as we are going to see in the last part of this tutorial, it is better to leave the n variable 4, 12. So here you put the number of neighbors you are considering without modifying that. So in order to do the fit, First of all, we need to figure out what part of the spectra we want to fit. For example, here, we want to fit, obviously, in the R space, because we want to have information about, the, the main information we want to have is the distance between our uh, backscattering atoms. And we are going to, the site, the window in the R space that we are going to fit. In order to do that, first of all, we have to choose the window in the K space to be transformed, to be Fourier transformed in the R space. So, as before with Athena, here we will have to use, to, to choose different parameters. So for example, here three seems okay. Maybe you can put 2.9 in order to have the starting point a little bit on the left. This end point, I think we can move right here around K 14 and a half. Okay, perfect. So now, we choose the R window using these parameters here. So we want to have a pretty narrow window around our main peak. And in this case, it will probably be 1.8. And uh, yeah, we can leave three. Also, I don't really like this really square uh, form. So I will put in the VR parameter 0 0.5. This VR control the shape of the window. And this is I like a little bit more, this one. So 1.7, maybe you can close a little bit this side, 2.8. Okay. So I think this is a, a good window in order to start our fitting. So now if we click on fit here, 
Artemis will use the variables that we given to this path, the window of pitching in the R dimension, and obviously the signal from our sample in order to do a proper fit. I click on fit, and this is the log. So here you have all the information, the numerical information about your fitting. About, first of all, the four variables you put in the guess depth set menu of our tennis. First of all, amp here, which corresponds to the S0 square variable, is 4.19 plus or minus 0 0.37. So I said to you before that an ideal S0 square value should be around 1. But here, the trick is that if I put the number of neighbors, the number one, this S0 square, which is refined together with the number of neighbors, will have the value of the number of neighbors. So in this case, we know that the first path is due to selenium, to four selenium atoms surrounding my cadmium. And so this value, this S0 square, this amp variable should be around four. And I can already tell you 4 point, well, uh, 19 plus minus 0 0.37 is a really good result. Mm, because you, how can I say, you already know that that is the kind of structure which mobilize in a proper way your system. So you already know that you will have four selenium neighbors. Unfortunately, the Z, S0 square value is affected by a lot of different factors because the quality of your analysis can depend on the, the temperature you perform your analysis, the quality of the monochromation, the setup itself, the amount of current in the beam. So all the different setup variables goes into S0 square. So each experiment that you're gonna do will have an S0 square value. You can repeat the same experiment in, uh, I don't know, two session, two, uh, two shift, and you will probably have two different S0 square values. Even if you remove the sample and you put your sample in the chamber again. So if you will, using this trick, so putting one in the N value and letting S0 square running free, if you get at the end of your fit something around the number you're going to expect, it is already good. Yes, if you would have obtained like two or three here, that means that there is a problem in your fitting, probably something that you have to correct. This value is already pretty good. Then the E naught variable the value controlling the delta energy. A really good value should be less than 10. So 3.86 plus minus 1.06 is really good. It means that your pitching is going as planned. Also, a sigma square, which is 0 0.006, plus or minus 0.005, it's pretty good. Uh, sigma square around uh, well, less than 0 0.01 is really, really good. And then finally, your del R variable, which is the most important. This control, this said to you, okay, the distance 
of the neighbors agents you have in your sample, how much is close to the distance of the neighbor agents that you will have in a pure structure like this CAF file you just gave to me. And this value minus 0.002 Armstrong plus or minus 0.005 is not perfect, but is a really good approximation. So this fits, I think it's a really good starting point for your fitting. Here you have uh, uh, other stuff, but also here it tells you that, okay, in the C files you gave to me, this is the value, the exact value of the bulk cadmium selenide. This is the value I suppose is in your analysis, which is pretty, pretty close. It's not bad. Also, if you see, if you go to the graphical window, not this one, you can have a graphical representation of your fitting. And here you can see that your model, which is in red, can pretty much modelize the peak itself. That means that this signal, the blue one, the blue peak around, in this case, you can, you can say 2.62 Armstrong. It is due mainly to the path selenium 1.1. Obviously, it would be really difficult to modelize the, the background noise. Probably this will be some residual in the fitting. But as I said, this is a pretty good conclusion for a first shell fitting. These are information, in particular the del R. You can bet your house on. Okay, they are pretty accurate. As I said, the number of neighbors, well, no, but the doubt that are is a pretty important information when you are acquiring SAS spectrum. And this is how you perform a pretty basic one shell fit. But as we saw before, in this menu right here, okay. You have many other paths that can contribute to your signal, to your spectrum. In particular, for example, you have the signal coming from the second shell, from the 12 cadmium atoms surrounding the four selenium, which in this case has a very high ranking number. So what we can do in order to see if our fit improve or not, you can take this path, put, um, drag also this path inside your path list, and do another fit taking into account also the presence of a second path. In order to do so, let's put again in the number of neighbors four, okay? So let, do not use the trick that I showed you before. And let's modelize also the second path using variables, using, using the guess that set menu which is right here. So for this second path, you want to keep S0 square as M, because obviously the S0 square is the same for all the equation. Delta energy will be also the same. So you will refine E naught as well. This delta R, I think you should use another variable in order to modelize it. So in this case, in the get set menu, you should add this other variable, del r1, for example, you can choose the name it that you want, starting from zero. 
sigma square, for now, you can use the same sigma square than before. Obviously, here you will have to change the uh, R window that you want to fit because now you are taking a signal which should come from a distance ref of 4.297 Armstrong. So at least here you have to go to five. Because you expect that this path should give you a response, a signal around 4.2 Armstrong, 4.2, 4.14. So if we click on fit, we can now take a look to the, uh, uh, to the log journal. So your reduced key square increased a lot. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really an important pa parameter. You, the important parameter are the variables you put in the guest that set menu. So the amp now is not reflecting as before the number of neighbors, because now you put in the number of neighbors the number of neighbors that the structure should have. So now the AMP variable is really reflecting the S0 square. So the quality of your analysis. 0 0.93 plus minus 0 0.29 is not bad at all, okay? So the E0 increased a little bit in respect of before but it is still under 10 so it is pretty good your sigma square variable is still under 0 0.01 really good but so now you have two different delta r one related to the first shell another related to the second shell and as you can see here the value of the first delt del r is pretty much similar to the one we found before, but the error increased a lot. 0 0.01 is something that you need to be aware of. The other one, the other delta r, well, is a lot bigger than the first one. 0 0.09 plus minus 0 0.02. As I said, it's not as good as before. Let's see the graphical fit. In order maybe to better understand. Okay. Perfect. You see, something is wrong with your fit. And that is reflecting the quality of the variables we see in the journal. For example, the position of the first peak of the fit didn't change as much. Maybe the delta the delt R relative to this peak, the first peak increase. That's true, but it's pretty much the same. But the intensity is completely wrong. While here you have a, a peak in your spectra, the theoretical one, that obviously you don't have in your experimental spectrum. And that's why the reduced key square was so high and you have such a high del R1 because you don't have this signal in your experimental data. You simply don't have. So what does it mean? It does mean that Unfortunately, in your experimental analysis, you are not able to observe a second shell. So this one, maybe under this noise, you will be able to extract some information, but not, not in this case. So you cannot fit that second path inside your spectrum. And 
your spectra is probably entirely due to the contribute of the first shell of selenium. And so in this case, you can simply do not include this path. You can repeat the fit as before, but first of all, you need to remember to skip this variable. Okay, in this menu, in this way, you will be able not to count this variable inside the fit. If you fit again, obviously, you will have again your journal, which have the best del R of the, a better del R than before, which is a little bit higher than the first fit we have done, because obviously I left on purpose a bigger R window to be fit. And obviously this signal here is not responsible for this noise right here. So obviously you will have higher errors in your variables, higher residuals, because there is no point of keeping such a large R window in order to fit this portion of the spectrum only, okay? But as you see, 90% of the SAS spectra of this SAS spectra of fitting starts with the fitting of the first shell. And a lot of them ends right there. Then you can play with your value. You can start to uh, use, instead of a simple variable like sigma square, here you can put a Debye Waller model. You can play with, uh, I don't know, other paths in order to try to see if some other paths are responsible for this signal, but probably this will be only noise, okay? So your goal in this case should be fit in the most accurate way possible this peak right here. But for example, let's try to do a multi-shell fit, okay? So let's take a sample with a good quality and with more than one path in the fit, which is, for example, the copper foil we saw before, okay? So if we close, I don't know if you have any questions about these cadmium selenite. Do you have anything to ask? Otherwise, we can simply move the other example, the copper foil. Okay, so I'll simply close this one. I think it's okay, don't say. Perfect. So let's import the signal we saw before. Well, I didn't make, I didn't save the key k file before, but I know where to retrieve it. Sorry, I'll take it immediately. Okay, so this is the key k file of the copper foil saved using Athena. Athena, Athena, I don't know the English parents of that program. So open it. And now you have, as before, your window with the copper key K file imported. So now you want to import a crystallographic information file relative to the copper. I've already downloaded it. So it should be a 
right here. All files. Okay. A file from uh, Wigov or Wigov. And this is information about my copper cryptographic information file. I'll say, okay, let's plot all the path up to six Armstrong. Let's calculate the position of all the atoms inside that six Armstrong range surrounding my copper atoms. Let's run the calculation of the different path of the scattered photoelectron, photoelectrons wave factors. So this is the list of all the different paths. So let's start importing the most probable one, which is this path due to the 12 copper atoms surrounding the central copper atoms. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look to the K window I'm using in order to do the fit. So the K window can be maybe tuned a little bit using this. So I'll take a minimum of 3.3 maybe, and a maximum, uh, I don't know, around here, for example, 17.7. A little bit closer, five. Okay, so my window doesn't cut enough any oscillation, so it's pretty good. I could, enlarge a little bit up to here the window itself but still be able to be around k17.5 it's a really 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 good result so now i can simply go to the r visualization space you see this is the result of my fourier transformation window and i can tune a little bit the window i want to fit so the, the portion of the space in the R dimension I want to fit. First of all, let's try to do a single shell fit like before. So to fit only the signal coming from this really, really intense peak. So here I will put uh, R window between, I don't know. Let's first of all change the shape. Okay. So I will go, I think, 1.4, uh, 2.8. Let's see. Okay, better. So now I will start to set my different variables. So S0 square as amp, delta energy as E naught. Del, delta R as delta F, sigma square at as SS. And I will put this variable inside the guest depth set menu. So M starting from one, E naught refine starting from zero, delta R starting from zero also, and Sigma square starting from 0 0.003. Here I can, for example, use the, uh, the other trick, putting n equals one in order to have the amp variable reflecting the number of neighbors directly. And so I think we can simply try a fit. This is the, the log of the fit. And as you can see, for example, the M here is not 12 as I was expecting. It is 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10.85, 10
plus minus 0 0.22. It's not bad, okay? As I said before, you don't have to trust M as the number of neighbors of the, uh, of the oh, as I said, as a quantitative number, okay? The real parameter in this case is the R. But I don't know if we put again 12 neighbors in the AMP variable, in the sorry, the N variable. Now the AMP variable should reflect the quality of the uh, of the fit itself. 0 0.90 plus minus 0 0.01 is pretty close to one. So it's good. In out, it is under 10. So also in this case, perfect. I don't have to correct anything else. Sigma square 0 0.004, pretty good. My del R, well, it has some error. 0 0.014, almost 15, is not as good as it was as I was expecting. Let's take a look to the graphical window. Which is right here. Come on. I don't know why it doesn't properly plot. Please tell me you didn't crash. This is the graphical window patina. Well, you can already see from this kind of visualization, if it's, even if it's not the best possible, that this fit is pretty good, okay? The first shell signal, even if I'm not able to make you see in the way I was planning, but this fit is pretty, pretty good. So in reality, in order to maybe to decrease the error on the distance, the only thing that you can really do here is try to fit the signal from the other path. Because probably it means that you can improve the quality if you take into account more path. I already can tell you that here it can really benefit from this kind of analysis. I don't know why my graphical window simply broke. But okay, let's try to change some parameter here. Maybe it will it will go it will uh, come back as planned. So no, huh? no, no, well so let's try to fit some of these other fits, okay? To do a multi-shell fit, because now I know that this kind of signal is not noise. You cannot say, okay, this noise is like, no, this is signal from the X up part of the spectrum. I really want to make you see also the K dimension of the fit, but well. So let's acquire more path inside our path list. So the second most important should be, for example, this one around 4.4 Armstrong. So let's take this one, okay? Obviously, always start to acquire path with a ranking above 10. Do not acquire the path with a ranking under 10. Let's try that only if you like an option, but you already know that they are will not probably contribute to your fit as the others. So let's take into account this one. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, let's start with this one only. Okay, and let's see how our fit goes. Now, 
we took the signal from atoms located at 4.4 Armstrong far from our central atom. So we need obviously to increase this width window up to at least, I think, 4.6. But I cannot see the window here. So it should be like here, probably. Okay. So let's put um, as, as zero square, E not as del R. In this case, del R1 as delta R and sigma square. So let's add this new variable I put inside the guess that set list. And let's try to fit again. So please tell me now that you are working. No, our graphical window is not responding anymore, apparently. But here you can already see that our fit didn't benefit too much on this addition. Not only because it is not capable to modelize this peak in a proper way, but also because also this first one shift a little bit. So it means that taking that path, it also decrease the precision of our fit in the first shell. What does it mean? It means that in this case, as before, I want to fit only the first shell using the first path. Well, no, because here, as I, we said, the, 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 the spectra is pretty complicated. So you have multiple influence from other paths. So probably here, you need to modelize to use more than only two paths. And so to try even to modelize this peak and probably even this one. So let's take again the list of the path. Or we can even have a look to the variables, but amp is really good, you know, it's really good, but this first del R is 0 0.018. It's, it's not good at all, okay? While this one, it would be perfect, but you need to consider also the error. 0 0.011 is a pretty big error. So let's take into account more path. In this case, I think we should take into account the 3.6 because you saw from the spectra that there is a signal coming out from around this distance here, 3.4, which is close to 3.6. So this probably, it is contributing. And also let's take the 477, which probably contributes to this signal and also to this one. So let's enlarge a little bit the window of fitting here to, I don't know, five, for example. Okay. So it's not able to, no, I'm not able to change the graphical window as I want. Sorry. Well, so let's take this fits window. And now let's put the different variables. So M should be always the same for all the paths. But since I'm adding multiple paths, in this case, I will have to use multiple other variables. But, oh, uh, no, sorry. I, I saw a question from Pedro, 0 0.01, too big for the R. Yeah, I want to try as much as possible to have a del R around 0 0.00 something, 0 0.003, 0 0.002. The most precise 
the battery is 0 0.01. I know that I can do better. Obviously, if you see from, that's why I was looking to the graphical window. If you see that, that peak, if you have one, only one peak, for example, your fit is pretty good. Your fitting peak, your fitting model is the same of the experimental data, probably that Del R is affected from, I don't know, some peak in the backgrounds because your model is not able to modelize the noise. Maybe you have much noise in the background in the low part of the spectra. You try to modelize a Fourier window, which is pretty big, and your system is giving you a Del R Pretty big because it, it is saying to you, okay, I'm able to modelize the peak, but I'm not able to modelize the noise. So a pretty uh, solution there could be uh, close the window, the fitting window on R in order to take only the signal of the peak and not the noise, for example. In this case, I can tell you that the response, the response is bad because I'm not taking into account all the real contributes, all the paths that are really contributes to my experimental spectrum. So in this case, delta uh, delta is zero is always enough. Okay, so I can put this one. But as I was saying, del R we need multiple variables in order to modelize that around the structure. The problem is that I don't want to use too many variables. Otherwise, obviously the system will find a way to fit my model. If I take too many variables, if I obviously unrelate all of them, it is not fair. Also, the system will tell me Okay, you are taking too many variables, only four paths, and I don't know, eight variables maybe are too much. So, how to deal with this problem when you are taking multiple paths like this? You take the first del R as del R, full stop. Then, all the other ones, there will be a new del R multiply by the ref value. Ref, as we said, is the theoretical distance between that shell and the central atoms. So doing that, putting a, a new del R as a variable multiplied by the ref, and obviously using the same notation for all the other paths, means that now you are modelizing all the other paths except for the first shell using the same del R, but taking into account that each of the shell has a different distance. So the del R around my structure should be the same, but it has to be modelized, taking into account that obviously we represent of the distance itself. In this way, you are able to use only one variable to modelize three different del R. And in order to modelize the sigma square, there is also another model that you can use, which is, for example, the common Debye Waller. In order to use the Debye Waller, uh, the Debye Waller approximation here in a bit. In our tennis, you need to, to write like this, the by, and in brackets, temp, defend. And you copy this notation on all the other paths. The by, temp, the temp, the by, temp temp the by temp d temp now in the guess that set menu which should be this one no okay this 
I will have M enough that R. This I'll skip for now. The R1, and here I will put temp, which is the starting temperature, which should be, I don't know, if I remember correctly, put 100, and this should be fixed. So, that upset, sorry. And then you put D temp here. 300 and you leave that as a guess variable. So you are giving the all the, the can I say the extreme temperatures which the system can use in order to modelize the thermal uh, agitation, the thermal factor inside your structure. You put set on the initial one and you give give to the system the possibility of changing the final temperature. So if we now fit it, let's see how the results will be. Well, in this case, much, much better from a graphical point of view. So you see that the first shell is probably modelized now. Also the tail of the peaks of the peak itself are better modelized than before, even if that is not a fundamental parameter. Here, finally, you have a little peak which is shown at almost the same distance than the experimental one. And also this other peak, even if it's not perfectly modelized, is better than before. You have also the, the apparition of this little peak here that show you that, okay, you did a good job, but in order to modelize also this one, two, three, fourth shell, you need some more facts, which obviously you will need also to modelize better this one and probably this one. So let's look to the journal. Here you have an M of 0 0.95 plus minus 0 0.15, which is pretty good. The E0 is under 10, perfect. Del R and Del R1, well, Del, Del R1 is pretty, pretty good. Minus 0.001 with an error of 0.004, it is pretty good. I don't know why the first one, the Del R relative to the first shell is still minus 0.015 which is not, uh, not enough, not enough at all. We can do better, but I cannot understand why, because from a graphical point of view, this first shell seems to be modelized pretty good. So what can we do, what can we do? Well, and the temp, as you can see, 282 Kelvin degrees plus minus 37 means that probably it was the, this, uh, this analysis was acquired at that temperature. So, so, so let's see. First of all, obviously, I will increase the number of paths. I am considering some defeats in order to modelize in a better way this portion here. So I will take, for example, okay. So we took the CU1, this, the two, this, the number three, which is this one, and the number, and this one here, C1, C3. So probably we should take also Maybe this one, which has a rank of 10.54. And this one, which has a rank of 10.59. Maybe also this, which has a rank much higher 
a, li a little bit farther away from our window of integration. So first of all, if we take 5.11, we'll need to increase our window of integration up to, I don't know, at least 5.2. Here, we put same variables of the other path. In order to do that, we can simply check all the paths we want to, to modify. Right click. I oh, know it's not like that in this version. So yeah, right click on the name of the variable, export this as zero square to mark paths, okay? So to the path, you have just clicked. So now you have um, on the other ones. And then you do the same with Enot. Export this, the mark paths. Delta R, mark paths. And Sigma square, mark paths. So now they should be all fine. Perfect. We don't have to add any more variables here. We can run the fit again. Okay, now the situation is a little bit better. It's a little bit, a lot better from this point of view, but also I think, and then we will check the journal for the first pick itself. You can see that the first shell now the, the boundaries of the peak the, now are not shifted. Before it, it, the peak it was a little bit shift on the right. So let's check the journal. So amp, pretty good. One plus minus 0.2. Enot is a little bit higher than before, but it is still under 10. Delta del R is a little bit better than before. Bus is we can still do better. Del R1 is pretty good. Hmm. So also in this case, probably we will need to increase the amount of path in order to be able to fit properly these two parts of the spectrum, okay, this and this. Maybe we can try, another thing that you can try, it is not always correct to really, to have the same del R1 for F. So you can try to, I don't know, put a new, there are variable for some of the path in order to see if something changed. You can try to, I don't know, maybe to use not the by waller for the first, for the first, okay, for the first um, path. Do again the fits and see if something's better. See, for example, not using the Debye Waller for the first shell. Maybe it is a good way, a good thing to do. Because now you have let the system, let Artemis to properly modelize the first oscillation without taking into account the same thermal, uh, thermal model for which is taking account in order to modelize all the other structures. So sometimes, obviously, the more variables you use, the better it is. You need to try to use the least amount of variable possible. That's true. But as I said before, for the del R, so now we are using a del R, which is independent from the del R1. Also using a sigma square independent for only the first shell, it is, maybe a good thing to do. Let's take a look to the log journal. AMP is okay, Enot is okay. Uh, sigma square, it is okay. So it means that, okay, we can use it. Del R1, 
is pretty much okay. But we wasn't we weren't able to really increase the quality of the Dell R of the first shell. So in this case you will have to try again changing variables, increasing the number of variables, increasing the number of paths you are using to the fit. There are some strategies that you can use. Also, this one should be only on two. But there are some strategies you can use in order to try to increase the quality of your fit. But an approximation, a really first, the, 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 how can I say, a really first approach to fitting SAS spectra is approximate this one. So, since we have only five minutes to four and a half, I think that I will stop sharing my screen. And I don't know if you have any more questions about this last part of our tennis. If you have curiosity, if you have other stuff. Hi, thank you very much for presentation. I may have a question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was using Athena to try to feed uh, nanoparticles, platinum nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. And I, I was taught that I should use the, the amp that I get from the foil. Uh, so I, once I did the, the, the feed, I got something about 0.7, but it doesn't work that good. Then I got from the five calculations that was about 0.97 and was much better and makes more sense because of the size of the, 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 the nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. So do you have a suggestion what is correct, what is not? Because sometimes the I fix amp, so I, I, I don't use like you. I mm -hmm. try to, to already calculate it in order to get the correct uh, coordination number. So <laughs> it's a little bit tricky because sometimes you're not sure if you're doing the right calculation or if it, if I just say how much I use the number that I have used, it, if this is enough or not. So I can tell you that in this case, a lot of experience helps. Uh, for example, Sometimes what you do is like performing an analysis with the same setup condition. So as much the same as much as, as the same setup condition as you. So start. You want to do an experiment of nanoparticles of platinum, perfect. So you have your setup. You know that you will go to a certain temperature. You will lose uh, a certain crystal in your monochromature. In order to have more uh, photons, you will use probably a silicium 111, a 311 in order to have more resolution. Okay. So you try the best setups possible in order to get the best quality for your signal. And then, for example, you put a standard. You put a platinum foil or some other stuff. And you try to do the fits with your platinum standard and to get an S0 square from that fit. Then for your nanoparticles, you start, if you want to take a fixed S0 square, you start taking the S0 square of the standard platinum foil. Obviously you, you need to replicate the experiment with the same setup and embed variables as possible. Because as I said, into the S0 square, unfortunately, goes everything. Everything that you cannot modelize with the other variables. So, okay, you have sigma square that takes into account the thermal agitation, but maybe the Debye Waller uh, model, as we saw before, is not enough in order to modelize all the shells. So you need also, if you, during one experiment, you use a different uh, crystal inside the model chromator, S0 square can change. If you use a different sample holder, sometimes can change. So uh, 
I don't know if you really want to have S0 square fixed. If you want, and if you are able, try to obtain the S0 square from a really simple experiment with a really simple structure that you already know it is like that. With nanoparticles, maybe it's a little bit tricky also because you have the effect of the roughness of the different specific volume. And that is another thing that can affect your S0 square. So from my point of view, I have very few experience. Uh, I have, it's like uh, six months I'm into this uh, SAS word. Nanoparticles can be really tricky. If you want, if you have some specific questions, maybe you can send me an email and I can ask to my supervisor here that has a really long experience in this kind of stuff. And maybe he will be able to give you some really good advice instead of me. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. If, we, if you don't have any other questions, I think we are perfectly on time. So half past four. And I really thank you for your uh, attention. I hope to have introduced you a little bit on the software that we commonly use in order to process the SAS data. I hope that you already have some basis from this morning, but also from your studies and your research activity, because it is pretty, for me, for example, which I'm a geologist starting to dig deep inside this kind of analysis at the beginning was a really bit tricky. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, from me, from Michela. And uh, for anything else, you have our contents. So have a good afternoon and I hope to see you soon in our laboratories.